Please welcome to the stage your GCP Summit MCs, the president of PACE LLC, Mr. Al Boinkin, and the president of C. Williams LLC, Mr. Charlie Williams. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Come on. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Give yourselves a, a round of applause and your hoos for man. Thanks for making the decision there to be back. So, welcome to the 2022 Government Contract Pricing Summit, and welcome back to San Diego. You know, over the past couple of years, we've had the opportunity to, uh, to stay virtual. But here we are, here in our, our seventh year. And uh, I'm excited to be your, your MC for, this is my seventh consecutive year. <laughs> no, it's pretty exciting and it's, it's just great to be a part of this. And as, you, as we heard Joe earlier, this is something that we put on for, for you all. There is so much information that is, that is here, but it's all for you. But you know, I'm, I'm equally excited to have, to have my uh, co-host, my, my wingman, my, you know, it's kind of like the, the Batman Robin, right? Yeah, uh, something like that. Kind of like the Maverick. But, but who's Goose. Batman and who's Robin? I'm not sure. What... Well, well, we'll figure that we'll out. We'll figure that out. Okay. But uh, it's good to have Charlie Williams with us here uh, as a, as a co-host this year. Charlie, welcome back. Thanks, Alan. I'm really appreciated to, to come be able to come back. Excited to be here with you guys. You know, Alan, I don't think I've worn this suit in a couple of years, but I just saved it for this particular occasion. You know, man, it so, looks uh, good. I, I'm ready to go, and I'm particularly excited to see these <laughs> folks. It's nothing like coming back to an in-person audience and seeing folks face to face, shaking hands with a little hand sanitizer behind that. Yeah, 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 good yeah, yeah, that's important. <laughs> you know, so again, this is our, our seventh year, but for the past two years, we've been virtual. But I can tell you, thanks to the pro price of folks, we haven't missed a beat. And some of y'all might have been a part of the, the virtual presentations over the last couple of years. Uh, some of y'all have been here with us for maybe all seven years, but uh, I, was, I had breakfast with, Betty, where are you? Raise your hand. Uh, I know you're out there somewhere. There's Betty. So Betty, uh, Betty shared with me that, hey, she has not missed an in-person session since we started. And uh, I know there's others out, out there like that. And some of y'all are here for your first time. Let me see a show of hands. Who's here for the first time? Wow. All yeah. right. All right. Yeah, that is awesome. So I, I, I tell you, it is, uh, you have a, there's a lot in store. So Charlie, let's talk about the, the elephant in the room, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, the, over the last couple of years, uh, we've had COVID. And what I would, I would encourage you to do is you find your comfort zone. The protocols here, uh, it's, it, mass is optional. But if you have your neighbor that decides or want, needs to wear that mask, let us be respectful of that and, uh, and just show them uh, their space. So, so please, uh, please do that. So here we are in our seventh year, right? Uh, I can tell you that it started with a, just a mere phone call with, uh, with Ken Silver. Ken, I, uh, he's probably out there somewhere, but there was a phone call that we had uh, and Ken said, well, hey, we'd like to put this forum together to where we can come together and, and just talk about pricing. And that was eight years ago. Uh, we didn't know if we needed to uh, rent out a, a ballroom space or if we needed to get a 10-person table at Denny's. But we, we opted for the, the ballroom space and we've, we've come a long way. We've evolved. So this is a great opportunity for us to continue to bring the wow factor with the speakers that we have and just everything. Our first, your first hand opportunity to meet and greet and talk with leadership and experts out there in the, in the pricing space. So, so Charlie, we've, uh, uh, we've had the opportunity to, to focus on some, some key areas, right? That all started that was a, set the foundation for where we were going to take the Government Contract Pricing Summit. Yeah, that's right. And, and we've always tried to ground the summit in some key principles, right? And those key principles being around collaboration, innovation, and synergy. And when we talk about collaboration, we've always tried to recognize the fact that, you know, really business doesn't get done if people don't get together and talk and work together, mm -hmm. whether it be on the industry side or the government side, bringing those communities together is extremely important. So, so we need to collaborate. 
we also need to innovate. You know, the, act, the, actual, the reality is the, the fact that uh, things are changing in our world each and every day. And if we don't feel, figure out and find the agile, innovative solutions, uh, then we're going to be left behind the things that, with respect to the things that we need to deliver to our customers. And then ultimately, synergy. That's about bringing the community together to recognize it's not just about us, but it's about the response and our ability to provide uh, capabilities to our end customer. It's all of us together, ultimately, that make a difference. And so we've grounded this uh, forum in those, uh, those three principles each and every year. And I think, Al, this year is no different, right? Right, right. So we continue that along that that line of, of themes. Our theme this year, cultivating agile solutions, right? And this year we wanna focus on the use of technology and in innovation to, to set that, that standard of excellence in, in pricing. You know, it's really a mission imperative that we, we try to find the most agile solutions that's gonna enable us to meet the challenges of the day uh, and in the coming years. So, and you know, it's, it's important not just for government, not just for, for industry, but it's important to all of us that we can create that common thread and that we can have the right conversations together so that we can figure out, you know, the business at hand and make, and make sure that we're, we're doing the right things uh, for, for the country. So we owe a, a debt of gratitude to, uh, to our uh, proprietor folks just for helping us to our uh, enable us to kind of have the space so that we can come and have these right conversations. So I just like to give a quick shout out to, to Joe Sherance. He was just up here. Just uh, thanks, Joe. Thanks, uh, Ken Silver, Josh Myers, uh, Raymond Yu, uh, Holly DeHesa, and the, the marketing team, and just countless others because it's really been uh, those efforts that's enabled us to really put something like this to, uh, together. So, uh, Charlie, I, I know we. We're gonna get ready to, to get this party started. Yeah, they, they can't so wait, right? They, they, can't wait. I, they can't wait, man. I think right. they're think they're about ready. But tell us a little bit about what can what can they expect. All right, just just a real quick. In a nutshell, you all are in for an exciting three days. We got a fully packed agenda with some very powerful speakers, breakouts, and all kinds of sessions for your learning, for your development, for your conversation, for your networking. Just a phenomenal. And I got to tell you, I'm not going to introduce the first day's keynote speaker. Al's going to do that in a few minutes, so I'm not going to talk about that. But, you know, we've got a day of technology panel coming up after this session this morning. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from a panel of government and industry experts uh, to talk about some very significant things that they're going through as they work through the challenges around uh, acquisition and contracting and pricing. Uh, and then we're going to hear from a, a, one, of, one of my favorite generals, uh, uh, Major General Cameron Holt. Uh, United States Air Force, and we'll introduce him tomorrow. Uh, but just a phenomenal speaker because we've asked him uh, and also our speaker this morning to help us paint the picture. What's the operational requirement? What's the perspective that we need to think about as we attempt to deliver goods and capabilities to our customers wherever they happen to be? And then finally on Friday, we're going to close with some dynamic speakers. We have Mr. David Cade here from, from Boeing, Vice President of Contracts and uh, things like that in Boeing. And then we're going to hear from Mr. John Tanaglia, who is the senior official in procurement yes, and acquisition in, in the Department of Defense. He is the contracting guy, uh, a wonderful gentleman, and he'll be able to tell you a little bit about what they're doing. So, so Al, it's just it's going to be phenomenal, and I, I think we need to get it started. So I'm going to walk off of here so you can do your thing. So are we going to be here for the whole week? Oh, man, okay. we, we need some time to, to make sure we hear from all of those folks, man. That's absolutely but, uh, right. This is going to be action-packed. All right, let's do this thing, days. man. All right. all right, man. Appreciate you. So, so everybody, uh, rules of engagement. This is your opportunity to, to have your voice heard. This is an opportunity for you really to, to really be a part of the conversation and to, to join in and help us to find the right kinds of solutions. So, uh, you know, years past, we've had the little cards on the tables, right, where you could write your little, your questions on there. But guess what? We've evolved. We're now, we're going to leverage technology and we're going to, to use that technology for you to be able to feed questions uh, to the speakers so that we can uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to hear from them. So you have on, uh, there's an app. So there's a GCPS. How many of you all have da downloaded the GCPS, the app? Okay, perfect. And if you haven't, go ahead and, uh, and take the opportunity to do that because as you click on, as you go to the speaker of the day, 
you'll be able to see there that there's a place for questions. All you need to do is just type in your question there, and uh, we're going to we're going to get those questions. We're going to address as many of those questions as we can before we uh, before the speaker concludes. Okay, so let's get on to our first speaker of the of the morning. I got to tell you, I I am really excited to have this year uh, to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Miss Joy White as our opening uh, keynote. And she's no stranger to GCP. Uh, as a matter of fact, she's been, she's spoken for us on a number of other occasions. But th this year, Joy joins us as the executive director for Space Systems Command, uh, US Space Force, developing and delivering agile, integrated, resilient space solutions to meet the critical needs of, uh, of the space domain. She's dual-hatted as the principal assistant to the Space Systems Integrator for Acquisitions, where she manages a, a portfolio, a budget of over $11 billion. She also leads a workforce of about 10,000 military, civilian, and, and contractor personnel. Uh, and the, the, key, the key role that they, those folks have is to fight and win in space. So she's gonna talk a little bit about that role and the kinds of things that those folks are doing to make, uh, to make a difference in the day. Uh, I like to say in her spare time that she's also the, uh, the head of the contracting activity for US Space Force. And she also serves on the board of directors for the National Contract Management Association. So even now, I encourage you to go ahead and start typing in your questions because Joy wants to hear from you. She wants to hear what you're thinking and what your thoughts are so that she can, she can address what those, uh, what those are. So without further ado, please join me, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the stage, Ms. Joy White. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure it is to be here. And boy, are those lights bright. I don't know how you ever see it now. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Al. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be in San Diego, right? It's just a great location. I love it that they come out to the West Coast um, to do this event um, every year, except for the COVID years. Um, I'm actually up in Los Angeles, and I'll talk more about that. So this is an easier trip for me than most of our, our East Coast endeavors. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about Space Systems Command, which is one of three commands in the United States Space Force. We're pretty new. We just um, celebrated our, we will be celebrating our first birthday in August. So it's a relatively new organization, um, and I want to explain what that's all about, what the Space Force is all about, um, why it was created to some degree, and then what we're doing in the acquisition realm in order to get after um, the threat that I'm going to talk about. And I love it that, um, that Charlie and Al talked about this, their goal of the summit as being collaboration, innovation, and synergy, because those are kind of things that I'm going to talk about throughout my um, talk today, things that we're trying to do at Space Systems Command in order to be able to be more resilient. So with that, I just thought for the first thing I do this morning, it's morning, get you, get you all going, I'm going to show you a little bit of a little video about Space Systems Command. So if you could please roll that video. Imagine waking up one morning without all the comforts and necessities afforded by our nation's efforts in space. Space capabilities support our supply chain, banking and financial systems, weather tracking, power grids, as well as air, land, and maritime infrastructures. Our 
U.S. military is the strongest, best trained, and most equipped in the world. In the heavily contested space domain, Space Systems Command leads a team of roughly 10,000 U.S. Space Force Guardians, airmen, and civilians who are on duty 24-7 and laser-focused on providing joint warfighters with the capabilities required to protect this nation and its allied partners from adversaries like China and Russia, who control an entire spectrum of very real threats to our space infrastructure. We are Space Systems Command. This unbeatable team is headquartered in Los Angeles, California, and operates across 16 geographically separated locations to include two space launch deltas, SLD-45 at Patrick Space Force Base Cape Canaveral in Florida, and SLD-30 at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Our new organizational structure was purpose-built to anticipate and respond to the challenges presented by a contested space domain. We are driving unity of effort across joint military forces to integrate space development efforts, accelerating the pace of space procurement programs, which allows us to deliver resilient space capabilities to warfighters faster. Assured access to space is a critical component of Space Systems Command. Of the more than 3,000 active satellites orbiting the Earth today, 2,000 belong to the United States. Through our efforts in launch acquisition and operations, we've sent up the majority of those payloads. From small scientific and experimental satellites to the largest national security payloads, our launches cannot and do not fail. Our team realizes the hostile nature of today's space landscape and the critical role acquisition plays in this process. From developing and buying capabilities and launch services to the computer software that controls the satellites and processes the data, space acquisition is a complex process with great financial responsibility. At Space Systems Command, we don't believe in no-win scenarios. Our Space C2 facility teaches our programmers and guardians to look at problems from new angles and find innovative solutions by changing the nature of the problem at hand. This outside-of-the-box thinking is critical to building future space systems architecture by creating and leveraging cutting-edge concepts and turning them into production-ready programs. Our adversaries are plotting for their turn to be number one, and we will absolutely not allow that to happen. We have the best people working in the best facilities, using the most agile, industry-leading methods to meet the needs of today, tomorrow, and beyond. At Space Systems Command, space starts here. All right. And that's my presentation. Questions? No. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so first I want to start with a little bit of history about um, Space Systems Command and our predecessor organizations. So we started back in 1954 when at that time General Bernard Schriever was sent out to the West Coast to counter the fact that the Russians were developing an ICBM capability. So he was sent out to the West Coast. Many say it was because that's where the technology hubs were, the propulsion industries, and that type of technology was already being developed. But a lot of folks also say they were trying to get them as far away from the Beltway, even back then, um, as, as we are today, 3,000 miles, in order to help them be able to be agile in the development. So he came out and was um, assigned to Inglewood, California. It was him and a handful of scientists and engineers, military and civilian. And they actually worked in a schoolhouse that was attached to a church in Inglewood on Arborvita. And they put up um, butcher block paper over the windows in order to create a classified environment. I guess gifts were a lot easier in those days. Um, <laughs> And they came to work every day in civilian clothes, and no one around really knew what they were working on. But 
they started, and it was a very aggressive, it was develop, test, fail, develop, test, fail, um, building hardware, bending metal right away. They weren't doing the, the, uh, the lengthy acquisition process that we see today. Um, and in three years, they developed and launched the first ICBM capability. So that's just amazing, that kind of technology in three years. And shortly thereafter, Russia launched Sputnik, the first satellite, um, and so these folks then were assigned the mission and actually accomplished um, launching the first satellite in just 1958, or 1959, excuse me, the Discoverer 1. So really rapid turn technology um, and really hard stuff to do, right? I mean, it, it is rocket scientists, it's rocket science. So that history is part of, part of our heritage. Um, Unfortunately, as the years go on, right, the, the bureaucracy creeps in, the, um, the processes for acquisition got more rigid, and, um, and I guess the, the time length between 3,000 miles got less and less um, because we started to get more, um, more slowed down because of, of a variety of things, and I'll talk more about that. Um, but to talk a little bit about the capabilities we deliver and kind of give you the concept of what what we do at Space Systems Command. So we have really um, five different mission areas that we deliver to. And, and it's very hard to see, I know, in this, in this OV-1, but this is kind of the overall space architecture that exists today. Um, we have missile warning capability. So those are satellites. It only takes four satellites to provide, it, because, to provide that missile warning um, capability because we don't, they're in geosynchronous orbit. And geosynchronous orbit is 22,000 miles from the Earth or beyond. And so when they're that far away, they can see a big portion of the Earth and they can pick up any kind of a missile launch anywhere in the world and get that reported in in, in seconds. Um, so that's one of our key uh, threat-based capabilities that we provide. We also provide advanced communication capability, and those satellites as well are up in geosynchronous orbit, so there's four of them, plus a couple more that provide um, help over the poles. Um, and that's where, if we had our worst day, if there was some kind of a launch of a nuclear um, event, that kind of satellite, that protected SATCOM provides the president with um, operate through communication capability. So it's really incredibly important so that he can contact anyone in the world during that kind of event and still have a secure conversation. We also have other communication satellites in geosynchronous orbit um, that provide more just wideband, their theater effects for the, war, for the war fighter that's on the ground. We also build the global positioning system. So that's pretty much everyone understands what that is. It operates in mid-Earth orbit or medium Earth, or Earth orbit, so it's about 1,200 miles from Earth up to the 22,000 mile mark. Um, those satellites, it takes 24 GPS satellites to create the capability that you're accustomed to. We actually have 32 on orbit today. Um, so that just adds and makes the capability greater. But one thing a lot of folks don't understand is that GPS also provides the ability, it's got atomic clocks on those satellites, so they provide accurate timing. So um, any ATM transaction that you do uses those clocks to ensure the fiscal security of it. Um, the agriculture community, so many different trucking industries, so many different industries rely on GPS. It's a trillion dollar um, capability that we offer out um, for, for all civil use and all world use. Then we also, you know, space, right? You can't really see what's going on in space, but we do know our adversaries are operating there. And so we have um, satellites that provide us space domain awareness. So they also operate in geosynchronous orbit and they can um, maneuver around and see what's going on up there and send down those messages um, so that we understand what our adversaries are doing. And I'll talk more about that too. We can also check on the health of our own satellites with that capability. And then the ground system is, is incredibly um, uh, challenging. We've built a ground system over the years. When we put up those satellites, they were originally cutting edge technology. So the ground systems are kind of stovepiped um, to those satellites. We're now trying to integrate that entire ground so that the different 
capabilities that are receiving missile warning and receiving comm can be integrated and we have a full sight picture of what's going on in space. Um, so it's highly complex. Another part of the Space Systems Command that we inherited um, as we stood up the command is bringing in those launch ranges. So both Vandenberg on the West Coast and Patrick on the East Coast are part of our organization. And the, the launch, um, the number of launches that are going up annually are just it's exponentially um, going up. And part of that's because of the commercial market. And that's also captured here in the, all of those little on the right hand side, those little dashes down there, that's the, where commercial industry tends to operate and that's low earth orbit. That's where the International Space Station flies um, and that's where most commercial entities um, provide their services. And those satellites, of course, launching those is a bit easier into low earth orbit versus trying to get a satellite out to the right place 22,000 miles away. Um, but that also gives them a better ability to transmit down. Um, less data than those big satellites up high can do, but still with, with the numbers, they can achieve great capability. So <clears throat> that kind of describes what, what's going on. But those geosynchronous satellites were put up in a peaceful time frame, right? That we, our adversaries weren't even operating in space. And the capability that our satellite systems have provided our warfighter our adversaries have started to see the asymmetrical advantage that that space capability gave us during the desert wars um, of the past. So those geosynchronous satellites, the four that make up a constellation, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General John Hyten, who just recently retired, you know, we call them high value assets because they cost quite a bit to build and they cost quite a bit to launch. He just called them fat, juicy targets. They're just sitting ducks up there, right? We don't have any kind of protections on board. And so that's where we started to recognize that we need to build, and the Space Force was stood up to help to build a more resilient space architecture um, that can overcome any kind of threats in space. So let's talk a little bit about the threat. So uh, if you can look down there in 2007 was kind of where the, this new realm of threat came in. The, on the, on the left-hand side of that chart is really just talking about um, af after Russia's, Russia, the wall came down and everything and the kind of the space, the space business kind of went down among our adversaries. But as you can see, it's climbing rapidly. Um, just to give you some thoughts on that, between 2019, I'm got, sorry, there's a lot of statistics here, so I'm gonna do some reading. Between 2019 and 2021, the combined operational space fleets of China and Russia have grown by approximately 70%. So they are aggressively going after space as the next frontier for them to, be, to win in. Their counter space capabilities continue to mature as well, including sophisticated anti-satellite weapons that can hold our assets at risk as well as our allies. And some examples, and this kind of flows with the timeline in that chart. In 2007, January 2007, China tested an anti-satellite weapon against their own weather satellite. That kinetic kill remains the most prolific and severe fragmentation event to the five decades of space human endeavors. When they knocked that satellite out of the sky, it was a kinetic, kinetic impact, they created 30,000 pieces of debris um, in orbit. And we're, we track, that's one of our other jobs from that last chart down on the bottom. We've got radars that track um, space debris and space objects and catalog all of it to try to help the commercial market and everyone else that's using space um, to avoid them. So you fast forward seven years after that 2007 event to May of 2014, the Russians launched what was assessed as three communication satellites. So just, you know, communication, that's not threatening. But then a fourth object appeared. First, it was thought to be a simple piece of space debris from the launch, but then it started to maneuver. We, we named that Object E and watched it as it rendezvoused and conducted a close proximity ops with a rocket body. So it could do the same thing with one of our satellites and you never know what it is doing while it's doing that. One of the big fears is um, our satellites, uh, if you could laze a satellite on orbit, and it could keep it from working for temporar temporarily, um, but that still would, would, could cause damage down below if someone was relying on that satellite at the moment of delays. In December of 2019, the Russians launched Cosmos 2542, 
a satellite similar to a Russian nesting doll. Cosmos 2542 released Cosmos 2543, whose on-orbit behavior um, was questionable, bordering on hostile, though Russia claims it was just an inspector satellite. In essence, it, it got close to another satellite on orbit. In July of 2020, Cosmos 2543 fired a projectile into outer space, demonstrating the ability to shoot and kill an on-orbit asset. In their latest test of the direct ascent mobile ground-based Nudal missile in November of 2021, Russia destroyed one of their defunct satellites in low Earth orbit. So that's in the orbit where all of the commercial capability and the International Space Station um, resides. They created a cloud of over 1,500 lethal, irrecoverable pieces of debris. And in fact, you may have read in the news, the astronauts actually scrambled to their escape pod um, when that first occurred to avoid the potential risk of one of those pieces of debris hitting them. If you've seen the movie Gravity, right? It's, it talks all about that. And then earlier this year, China's um, Shurgen satellite docked with a defunct Beidou navigation satellite, and it performed a large burn move. This is one's really scary. And it took the satellite, moved it out of geo, out of the geosynchronous belt, and then itself returned back to the geosynchronous belt. So China said that that kind of um, prox uh, proximity move was really because they're practicing their own on-orbit servicing of their satellites. But obviously, if they can come and pull a satellite out of geosynchronous orbit, that's of high risk to us, one of those four satellites I talked about in one, some of our key capability areas. So these are just some of the examples, as well as that I can talk about in this room, um, of recent counter space and hypersonic demonstrations by Russia, China, and even North Korea and Iran. And it shows a willingness for, for all, from all of those countries to break from international norms of behavior in space. And that's what the Space Force and Space Systems Command was stood up to do, was to counter that threat and ensure that anyone, commercial, our allies, can operate safely in space um, and continue to deliver the kinds of phenomenal capabilities our world needs that come from the space domain. So, Talking about the threat, we talk about space as being contested, congested, and competitive, and the threat is what makes it contested, clearly. But the congestion is another interesting um, dynamic that's going on. Um, we've got, you can look at, this is between 1960 and 2019, and how many things are um, circling our, our globe. As of March of 22, it's estimated that nearly 13,000 satellites have been launched since 1957. And as you heard in the video, about 4,000 of those, 4,500, are today operational satellites. Um, many of them ours, but the, the growing number of commercial is, is um, phenomenal. Um, we're also tracking close to 50,000 objects in space, and that's only the pieces that our radars can detect. It's estimated that there could be potentially 100 million pieces of debris floating around our Earth right now. So it's really, um, that's another dynamic in terms of the strategy for how you do business in space when, you're got, when you know you're dealing with what was, when we were building our initial satellites at the Western Development Division, right, it looked like 1960. It certainly didn't look like today, and that changes your strategic perspective on how you're gonna go about doing things. And then finally, competitive, um, so that's a good thing, right? I mean, contested is bad, congested is bad or hard. Um, but competitive is, is kind of awesome because it's offering us all sorts of opportunities to go about um, achieving what we need to do in space differently. Because if we can leverage the commercial marketplace, if industry is already innovating in a certain way, we can take advantage of that. And so that's something that we're building out at Space Systems Command to enable us to better take advantage of what the commercial marketplace is doing. Last year, the global space economy was valued at 424 billion, having grown 70% since 2010. We've also seen a significant increase in private investment in space, with $17.1 billion of venture capital invested in the space industry in 2020. This explosion of growth in the space sector is due in a significant is also due, if you go to the middle chart there, to the decline in space co uh, in launch costs. So it costs far less, 40 times less, to launch a satellite into space 
than it used to in the 1980s. So we've been, when we started back in the 50s and the 60s, you know, no one else needed rocket launch capability. So we were building very unique one-off launch and, and rockets. But now with, with the commercial industry booming and these small satellites becoming available, there's all sorts of different small launch companies getting birth. Um, the fact that like SpaceX started it and now others are following the reusable boosters. So we're no longer building we were building single boosters for rockets, or you'd put up five, and they'd just fall into the ocean. Well, now SpaceX is bringing those back and reusing them, refurbishing them, reusing them, and Blue Origin is following suit with a similar type of technology, well, different technology, but a similar capability to reuse. We've seen uh, small launch companies that are, one is gonna do completely 3D manufacturing of all the parts to build their rockets. Another is testing out whether they can put a missile on a fighter aircraft that could launch a satellite um, without having to do it from the ground, from the infrastructure of a launch pad. So there's all sorts of really unique opportunities coming at us from the commercial marketplace. And it's actually, I think in the end, it's gonna make our jobs easier. Um, but right now, trying to integrate what they're doing with what we've already been doing and changing our mindset on what our architecture looks like um, is the challenge ahead of us. And of course, Congress and the President have recognized the significance of, of protecting space for all of our war fighting domain, because everything we do on the ground in war now relies and is linked to space capabilities. So they did increase the budget for space, um, $5 billion between FY22 and FY23. We'll see how that comes out through the, uh, through the congressional process, but that's where we are today. Um, and that's a significant increase um, for us to go get after some of the threat. So what are, old school acquisition um, was not optimized for, uh, for what we need to do today for speed. And I, I don't know, does this chart build? I think it does, there we go. So when, we start, when, when we're doing those custom-built geosynchronous orbit satellites, um, first of all, the technology is really hard. But getting those acquisition strategies approved, it was complex. They were very high dollar. Each one of those satellites ran over a billion dollars. So the, getting the acquisition strategy approved through the traditional 5,000 process could take two to three years. We'd then do the actual acquisition, right? A complex source selection, highly competitive, uh, kind of a winner go home, so everybody's very um, scrutinizing of the act of the source selection process. So those would tend to take three years, and then you'd start the build, the development, and then the build, and it would take seven years. So by the time we got the we got a requirement back um, twelve years ago, before we're delivering the technology on orbit, and oftentimes then that technology was not even the modern most recent technology because we started so much earlier. So we recognize that we really need to figure out a way to get delivery of capability much, much more quickly. Um, and that's part of what Space Systems Command is getting after today. So what are we doing? So this kind of shows the, uh, the phasing of how we're thinking about things. Our first choice is to buy before build. So, and it's not even buying a satellite. First thing is, can we just buy the services? Can we just buy the data? Um, you all are seeing, if you've read in the news, you know, Maxar is providing data, um, pictures from the Ukraine. So can we, as a, as a Department of Defense, just rely on what's already commercially being offered um, and to the maximum extent practicable um, by that capability? or buy those services. And we're already demonstrating that as part of the stand-up of Space Systems Command. They rolled in an organization that was at DISA, um, that's the Commercial SATCOM Communi um, Services Office, or Cisco. Um, and they do, they operate just a variety of contracts, hundreds of contracts, and provide bandwidth to DOD warfighter users on a kind of a buy the drink approach. So that's one way of doing commercial, of buying commercial and getting it down to the warfighter faster. Another way is to, to buy off the shelf, you know, those, those small rocket launches, those small satellites that are out there. How can we repurpose them for our needs, right? So that's another piece of the analysis that we do. But of course, as you go on across, um, we can adapt, you know, we can modify commercial capability. 
were needed, but then in some cases we still are going to need to create because some of what you need for the warfighter for Department of Defense is going to be unique and not being purchased in the commercial market. So our commercial services office, we just stood up in January, and that's what they're doing is reaching out and finding out what kinds of data and services are already out there that we could just be bringing into the mix, bringing into that library where we're tracking the debris and tracking operations in space. How can we make that all play together? So they've, as I talked about, communication services were already very robustly engaged there. That Cisco office's man, ma, office manages $5.4 billion over five years of commercial SATCOM bandwidth contracts. Um, so it's a huge, huge industry um, that we're taking advantage of. But we're also excited to kind of scale that capability and we're looking at can we buy space domain awareness data on the commercial market? Can we find other ways of doing GPS or precision navigation and timing through the commercial market? Can we buy weather capability? Because we still build weather satellites. Can we buy weather capability um, services without having to go build something unique? So those are all in play um, as part of our commercial services office. Next though, and this to me is the, a really interesting piece of Space Systems Command, is allied by design. So first we're looking at the commercial market when we identify a capability that we need, but next we're talking to our allies. And it's been absolutely amazing how much they want to partner um, and in a variety of ways. For example, many, of, um, many countries have stood up their own space forces. I know we met recently with the Australian, their new space command. Um, so it's happening all over the world. Our allies are recognizing as much as we have that space is truly something that um, is, is an asymmetrical advantage to everything they do. So you can see in all the different mission areas that we provide, um, we've got multiple countries aligned with us, partnering with us. We're working with the Japanese to put one of our space domain awareness payloads on one of their GPS kind of like uh, satellites. So they're getting ready to build out their own kind of global positioning system, but they had room on one of their satellite buses to, to host, host another payload. So we're working with them on that. Another example is with Norway. So they were building a satellite, um, a purpose-built satellite that, again, they had room on their, on their satellite bus and they offered for us to put a, one of our commu communication payloads on it. And then they're paying for the launch and they're paying for the satellite and we're paying just for the payload. So we've saved the tax dollars um, of doing, we estimate we saved $900 million by partnering with Norway on that launch. Others, other of our allies, they just wanna put money in. They just wanna help us buy um, like communication satellites and then they get their own bandwidth down from those satellites. So they just wanna be partners with us that way. Others wanna know what can they build that would be complementary to what our architecture looks like. So they could plug into our architecture and add data to it, but they wanna build their own things. And so we're helping them do that. In fact, Australia is standing up their own program office for satellite builds. And we've got actually folks that are gonna be in that office to help them formulate that because it's the first time they've done it. So it's just, um, it's wonderful to be able to work with our allies. It helps us build that more resilient architecture because you've got kind of the whole world relying on it instead of just the US. So um, it's a really exciting time and we've got um, our international office is a direct report to the commander at Space Systems Command and they're pretty much doing all the work for Space Systems Command, for, for the Space Force, not just for Space Systems Command. And then of course, if you think about that chart that talks about the process, you know, buy before build, adapt what we can. In the end game, partner with our allies. In the end game, we still will do some traditional acquisitions where we're going to build the capability because no one else really needs it. And in those instances, we're taking advantage of what OSD built, the adaptive acquisition framework. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, mid-tier mid acquisition um, approaches, which, and this, the advantage of those, of course, is that you got to deliver the prototype in five years. So that 12-year process isn't even in the game if you're playing with a mid-tier acquisition. 
They also give us the capability to tailor the documents that are required to get your acquisition approval up front. So that has saved a great deal of time because you can only, you only need to build the documentation that is actually required to prove out the prototype um, strategy. Uh, in the old days, I mean, if you think about the 5000 series, it was really built for airplanes and ships. And so there's a lot of things in there that you don't do with satellites. You don't need a big, big supply chain um, depot maintenance plan for a satellite. You're not bringing it down and fixing it, um, at least not yet. <laughs> so the, um, the mid-tier acquisition has really helped us to streamline how we do our satellite builds. Um, they also, we designate um, Space Systems Command, as Al mentioned, I'm the head of the contracting activity for Space Systems Command. That's a designation down um, into the Space Force. And the advantage of that is simply that I'm, I'm in the command where we're doing the acquisition, so I'm very familiar with what contracting activity and acquisitions are going on. So it's much easier for me to then approve things that come through because I already know about what's going on. There's not a, a teaching time frame between it to explain why I need to approve whatever as the head of the contracting activity. And then standing up the SSC front door. So this is kind of the, uh, you know, you've got a a labyrinth. For industry, it's very hard sometimes um, to figure out, I've got this great idea. I've got this great innovative commercial idea. Who do I go tell about it to? I mean, I'll get cold emails from industry saying, hey, I've got this great new satellite. It works and I want to sell it to you. And, you know, it, it's probably not the greatest to come to me, you know, because as you all, are, you know, you got a thousand emails a day it's, and that's not your focus is to try to get innovation in the door. So we've stood up a front door for that purpose. And it, that barcode is hot, so you can, it's not, it, we're st it's still in its infancy, so that'll just take you to another a website um, that's still not as, not as far along as we want to get it. But, but the point of this organization is going to be, you never, you never get a, a cold, you're not getting, you're getting received, right? So if you call in, if you email in, you get a response, and then they've got guides that are going to be set up to guide whatever your capability is into the right place in Space Systems Command, or actually anywhere else, if it's Air Force or Navy, if it's really not a space-related acquisition opportunity, but for someone else. So the goal is to get, get connect commercial and small, unfamiliar companies, get them in the door and help guide them through the process so that they can more easily be, get their innovations into our, into our architecture, into our resilient architecture. Some other points I just want to make on this particular chart is that we're also working to get the warfighter more integrated with acquisition. So up there in that upper left-hand corner, those are we've, we've actually stood up the warfighter integration office, which is where we're taking our acquisition professionals and we're putting them into the combatant commands. So the folks that are actually using those capabilities um, are sitting right next to the acquisition guy, and the acquisition guy can, can see what problems the capability we delivered are causing if it's not working right. They can also help, you know, um, innovators can come into the, into the warfighter's office and the combatant command with their ideas. Well, this acquisition body there can help then translate that back into the acquisition command so we can actually deliver the capability. We also stood up a program integration council. Um, there's a lot of organizations still in space. It's not just Space Systems Command. We got Space Development Agency out there. We've got um, the Rapid Capability Offices um, and, of course, Missile Defense Agency and the National Reconnaissance Organization all deliver some types of space capabilities. So the Program Integration Council is intended that when a requirement is identified, they look at it and decide which acquisition organization is best suited to deliver that capability. Um, and in some cases, it's a joint effort. For example, our latest force design is missile warning, missile track. So the next generation of that missile warning capability, and that's going to be a joint program office with Missile Defense Agency, Space Development Agency, and SSC. And then finally, as I mentioned, our international allies. Now, the international allies could come through the SSC front door, and they would be guided to the right place. But they also have a more direct line in through our, um, our international affairs office. And then finally, um, back talking about mid-tier acquisitions and how we can do speed. Um, the Space Enterprise Consortium, we stood it up originally in 2017, and then we reinvigorated it in 2019 because it was so popular, um, we elevated the ceiling. That's a other transaction agreement with a $12 billion ceiling, and it can go for 10 years. And what that does is it's, it's um, 
we've got over 640 companies are part of the Space Enterprise Consortium. And over 70% of those companies are non-traditional um, government businesses. So they don't typically do business with the government, but they're innovators and they're, they're out cutting edge space kind of capability. And the manager helps guide them also through the, um, what can be challenging government process. The other piece of that organization, of the spec that has been wonderful is that um, between FY19 and FY21, they achieved a 40% reduction in the prototype award timelines. So this is all, it's all for prototypes that they can tra then can tr transition into real world capability. Um, but it's just been an amazing tool. We're, we're awarding them typically in 60 days or less. So that's just phenomenal compared to that, that three year time frame that I talked about on the traditional acquisition timeline chart. So, so far they've made 99 awards on the spec, um, the spec vehicle, and that has valued at a total of 1.6 billion. So it's really been a, an excellent tool for keeping things um, moving quickly and getting prototypes. And actually once the prototype's delivered on orbit, if it works, we just operationalize it. So it's again, getting us more capability faster to make our overall space enterprise more resilient to the threat. And it really is all about the threat. And I know when you hear from General Holt, um, I think it's tomorrow, he will talk um, even more about, about how scared he is about the threat of China and Russia and what they're doing. And so that's everything we do is about that. Um, my boss, uh, well, General Jay Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations has talked about the fact that we cannot afford to lose space. Without it, we will fail. And if you look at the annual DOD budget, Space is like 3% of that budget. But General Raymond likes to talk about the fact that pretty much everything else in that budget that's built needs space in order to operate. And so it's absolutely critical that we be able to defend what we're doing in space and, and protect it from our adversaries. And my boss rolled in, General Mike Gutlein rolled in last summer um, and talked about um, his view, and you'll hear Secretary of the Air Force Kendall talk about it too, their view is that we have to have this resilient architecture operating by 2026 because they see a threat coming in 2027. So that's our goal, is to very rapidly develop and field new capabilities and integrate them. And that's what's going on at Space Systems Command. And one of our other mottos is fights on and we're ready. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here and I think I'm gonna do some questions now. Wow, thanks, Joy. You can sit here. Okay. My pleasure. So, Joy, we, we have a, a number of questions that, that's come in. And be first kind. of all, thank you for being <laughs> inspired by, by, by what Space Force is doing. So, thank you all for what you do. Uh, let's just get to it. There's a, there's a question here, and it's interesting how this technology works is that folks are able to vote on questions that, that come up. And, there were a wow. number of, uh, on this particular question that, that have interest. How, are you leveraging artificial intelligence to support your acquisitions and, and, and how? <laughs> Not yet. We would like to do that. We've, we're, so we're, that's one of our other initiatives um, at Space Systems Command and the United States Space Force is to um, leverage digital engineering, leverage machine learning, and of course, leverage artificial intelligence, but we are, we're not there yet. We're, we're in the infancy stages of it. Um, and I think we're looking to industry for ideas on how to innovate in those realms. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we've built, we've built an innovation shop that's looking into those things. You know, we, my dream, I've told people, my dream is you know, that you have an iPhone app that you can write your proposal on, right? And submit it and, and, and ease, ease of source selection, right? <laughs> So I've put that out there to my team. I, I'm not sure where they are with it just yet, so. Okay, so I was intrigued by uh, one of your, your charts. You talked about old school acquisition. Uh, were you talking about me? Or was that, uh, no, I, it'd, be, it'd be us together. Oh, okay, okay, well that's, that's all good. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting question. What is the biggest acquisition barrier that prevents increased speed to contracted solutions? So, 
I would, I would suggest, because we keep, we keep talking about speed and talking about speed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really think one of the biggest barriers is, is people that, um, that don't think that way. And, they, and, they're, and they're, we need all of our folks to be thinking innovatively about everything they do. Mm -hmm. and, and too often, I think, what I find is that one guy's trying to, to go fast but another guy still feels like that the, the reason they're here is to do certain things and you know, almost checklist mentality, and those things aren't fast by, by nature. I mean, some of this is hard. I mean, what you guys do, pricing is hard, right? And, and it doesn't, <laughs> it, it's, it does take some methodical thought process. And so how do you make that go faster, right? And then, mm -hmm. then the next piece, the technical, the technical evaluations, the audits, everything that you do, that all add all add length to the process. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I think that automation is still the key for getting around that, and I think um, that's the way we're going to speed things up. Yeah, there's a and, and there's a, a, another similar question that is: if speed is important, how will acquisition become agile? <laughs> to achieve those those right. goals, so but but I and I will say so. My former boss and and um, I agree with him. It's it's more than just acquisition. You know, he used to talk about. In fact, in his retirement speech, he talked about the fact that we've been talking about making acquisition agile for the last 25, 30 years, right? But he's like, what about the requirements process? What, how do we make that go faster? Um, it's, it takes quite a bit of time to get an actual requirement, and Space Force is actually going after that. We stood up what's called the Space Warfighting Analysis Center, um, and they are building out force designs for each of those mission capabilities that I talked about. And then we're trying to do digital models for taking, so they're building out, they do gaming against the threat. And, and find out what does the capability need to be. And then they f the goal here is to feed that almost digitally into the requirements process and then speed the requirements process, which is something the Space Force is going after in terms of how do we get through the, through the J-ROC and quickly get requirements moving forward. Yes. And, and so the SWAC is a key part of that. They also stood up the, the Space Acquisition Council, which is um, led, it's, it's formally led by the SECAF and, and designated by Congress. But again, all trying to get stronger linkage between the requirements process and the acquisition process so that we can turn more on a dime. Because that's what our adversaries are doing. Every, every time we see a threat like the ones I talked about, we need to be responding. We shouldn't be responding. We should be ahead of it, right? right. But if we have to respond, it can't be you know, two years before the requirement gets generated and we start the acquisition process. And then take that to the next step, and we've talked, you and I talked about the, mm -hmm. the um, PBB&E commission. Right. That's critical, right? And you hear innovation companies and venture capitalists talking about the fact that how can we be innovative when we don't have money it takes us, you know, we're doing the fight up. We, we don't even get the funds to do new cutting edge things for two years at least. It takes to get them into the budget. So all of those things I think working together um, need to be accelerated, not just keep pounding on the acquisition community. And, and I, know the, I know the pricing community, I watched, you know, um, mm -hmm. tried to defend as, because that takes some amount of time, but it's not, it's not the long pole in the tent, and it's absolutely critical to making sure, because we gotta make those taxpayer dollars go farther. That's what's great about the commercial market and what we can do there. If we can leverage, you know, um, SpaceX has put up 2,500 satellites as part of their Starlink constellation to bring internet to the world, right? If we can leverage some of those commercial capabilities in low Earth orbit, and then that way, if, if, if one of those geosynchronous satellites does get taken out, and we, but if we can rely and integrate with the commercial capabilities and make sure they're there in a time of conflict, um, just think how much more capability we're delivering. Right, right. So Joy, uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But uh, there's been a number of questions that's come in relative to uh, getting cost data from from industry and the challenges associated with that. And 
And we're going to save some of those questions for Mr. Tanagli and, okay. and even our federal <laughs> panel for tomorrow as well. But what are your thoughts on ways that we can bridge that gap and be able to get the right level of cost data? And are we asking the right questions even? So I think, yeah, I, so I'm a big fan of tailoring. I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm a contracting person by trade, so protecting taxpayer dollars and being stu good stewards is absolutely a must. But, but that, that smart tailoring of what we're requesting, understanding, I think understanding, um, and that's tricky, but understanding every contractor's system more deeply mm -hmm. so that we know what they can deliver and listening to them when they talk about what they can deliver. Um, and, and figuring out whether that's adequate. Um, so just not always going to the book answer first, right? Yes. But trying to find what is, what is the niche? What do we really need to understand in order to do, to do the pricing effort? Um, and the cost estimating is critical. All right. So we'd be remiss if we didn't ask this question. We have a lot of new folks out here, uh, new professionals. In, in your opinion, uh, as, we, as they look to further and grow their careers, are there two things in particular of just uh, information or advice that you could give the new professionals in terms of what they want to focus on? Well, space. <laughs> 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 no. um, so uh, what I, I highly recommend for new professionals, learn, learn your craft, your field deeply, quickly, but deeply. Um, but then be ready to broaden. Um, you know, I always talk about it, it's, it's not helpful to just go after every, um, every promotion and, and not be deeply understanding of where you're coming from because you can end up getting to certain grade levels and certain promotion levels where you're, you're, you've done a lot of things, but you only have, you know, this little surface layer of knowledge. I really think um, learning your craft first and then expanding, and I, I, I always think of it like a spider web. I think the, the most successful professionals I've seen, they, you know, if you're a pricer, like deeply understand pricing and cost estimating, but then go off and either, I mean, you don't have to stay in contracting, go to finance, mm. go to program management, and then learn those other, but kind of kind of bloom, right? Like a flower in terms of understanding all the different acquisition functional areas, because that just makes you far more va valuable of a team member and far more valuable of a, of a professional. Great. Joy, thank you so much for your, your time this morning and, and coming to join us as the uh, opening keynote uh, this morning. It's, it's been wonderful. Everybody give me a round of applause for Thanks. Mr. Joy White. Thanks. Thank you so much Thanks. once again. Hey, my pleasure. Yes. We're going to go ahead and take, our, take a break, please. Uh, Get ready for your 10 o'clock sessions, and we'll see you back this afternoon for the plenary session on technology and innovation, okay? Thanks again.